If you have a Bible, open up to 2 Samuel chapter 14. 2 Samuel chapter 14. Um, we're going to pick up reading where we left off just a little bit ago in verse 12. And we're going to read down into verse 21 this morning. 2 Samuel uh, chapter 14, 12 through 21. We'll be looking at the whole chapter, so keep your Bibles open once we get uh, open there. We'll, we'll get on down almost 15 there, the last verse of 14. So uh, we'll be looking at the whole chapter, but we're going to read for, uh, 12 through 21 here in just a few moments. As you're opening up there, let me remind you again is what he's already mentioned. Coming up soon is our Valentine's auction. Um, we, years ago, started having an auction um, to uh, raise money for originally a capital campaign we were in, and then everybody enjoyed the auction so much that uh, we kept doing it and now use the money for missions. So we're excited about it, and um, you might say, I don't have um, money to uh, buy a bunch of stuff, and that's okay. It's cheap entertainment. And so I would encourage you uh, to be here no matter what. Second Samuel chapter 14, verses 12 through 21. Uh, If you don't mind, stand with me out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. The author writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God Himself is speaking to us. Beginning, verse 12. Then the woman said, Please, let your servant speak a word to my Lord the king. And he said, speak. And the woman said, why then have you planned such a thing against the people of God? For in giving this decision, the king convicts himself inasmuch as the king does not bring his banished one home again. We must all die. We are like water spilled on the ground which cannot be gathered up again. But God will not take away life, and He devises means so that the banished one will not remain an outcast. Now I have come to say this to my Lord the King, because the people have made me afraid. And your servant thought, I will speak to the King. It may be that the King will perform the request of His servant. The King will hear and deliver His servant from the hand of the man who would destroy me and my son together from the heritage of God. Your servant thought, The word of my Lord the King will set me at rest. For my Lord the King is like the angel of God to discern good and evil. The Lord your God be with you. And then the king answered the woman, Do not hide from me anything I ask you. And the woman said, Let my Lord the King speak. And the king said, Is the hand of Joab with you in all this? The woman answered and said, As surely as you live, my lord the king, one cannot turn to the right hand or to the left from anything that my lord the king has said. It was your servant Joab who commanded me. It was he who put all these words in the mouth of your servant. In order to change the course of things, your servant Joab did this. But my lord has wisdom like the wisdom of the angel of God to know all the things that are on the earth. Verse 21, Then the king said to Joab, Behold now, I grant this. Go, bring back the young man, Absalom. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his gospel. And oh God, I pray that each of us here would see the gospel wisdom in the Bible. And Lord, that we would respond to it by the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. When I was the very new pastor here at First Baptist Gadsden, nearly 12 years ago now, uh, back then we uh, had a daycare that was still open at that point in time, and our daycare director invited me to come speak in chapel to the children um, in the daycare. So there I went down the hall to the chapel, uh, down here, the chapel, and that's where they had chapel, and I went there to share with the kids. And so as I'm walking into the chapel, I see the teachers and the director and others saying, okay, kids, take the, uh, take the cushions and, and, and put them up and, and sit back down on the pew and and put the cushions behind you. So if you imagine you're sitting on a pew right now, if you were to take the cushion that you're sitting on, they can't, they don't try it. Okay. They're, uh, upholstered. So don't, don't do this, but in other places we can. In the chapel, you can try it sometime. You, you take the, if you just imagine taking the cushion, standing up, and 
putting it against the back of the pew and sitting back down. So you'd be sitting on the hard wood and leaning back against the cushion. And so as they're doing this, I thought, why are they doing this? This is a funny thing. And I asked the director, I said, do you know why we do this? And she said, no, I really don't. And so I thought more than likely what it was is that for some reason or another, folks were afraid, uh, people over in the history of the daycare were afraid that they would mess the cushions up or do something to the cushions. They put them up so they can't mess the cushions up. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a young, cool pastor. So I want to do a cool thing for these kids. They don't want to sit on this hard pew, you know. So I was like, hey, you get, would you guys rather sit on the soft cushions? And they were like, yeah, we would rather sit on the soft cushions. I was like, all right, everybody up, everybody up. And they all stood up, and I said, put your cushions down, everybody sit on the cushions. And I was like, man, this is great. I'm so wise. Um, these kids are, <laughs> these kids are going to love me. And so, and so um, they're going to go home and tell their parents, and they're all going to come join the church. This is going to be wonderful. <laughs> And so I uh, began teaching um, something that I'm sure was terrible and way over their heads. And so I began teaching, and then all of a sudden I noticed something happening in the chapel. Children are entering the floor. And I realized that what's happening is, as they're sitting there on the pews, the cushions are sliding off the pew and sliding into the floor. And by the time I notice what's happening, I've lost half the daycare to the floor. And so you know what I said, right? Everybody get up, take your pew cushion, and lean it up against the back of the pew, and then sit back down, and let's try to finish chapel this morning. Now, here's the reality. We don't always know wisdom when we see it, do we? And on top of that, wisdom is not always easy to receive, is it? We don't always see wisdom for what it is. And as Christians, I think this is easy for us sometimes to, to miss. We, we here at First Baptist Gadsden, and all Christian people ought to be, gospel people. Uh, we're, we're passionate about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. One, one of the things we're trying to do in, in our church is think through how to apply the gospel to every facet of our lives. What does it mean for the gospel to be true, and how does that impact everything I do? And so we think a lot about what it means then to love others. That's what it means to be gospel people. We love others. What does it mean to be gracious and kind toward other people? What does it mean to turn the other cheek? What does it mean to live the way that Jesus told us to live? I, I'm still convinced that the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' description of how to live as gospel people. This is how the gospel, what Jesus was doing through his cross and his resurrection, would impact our lives and ought to impact our lives. Sometimes, though, we can start to feel like living like gospel people is a little bit of a handicap, right? It feels like we are just kind of putting ourselves out there a lot, but not really getting much back for it. But I want you to know something. The gospel of grace is not only a good thing for us personally, but it's also, on top of that, the wisest way to live in the world that God has made. I was at a board meeting one time, and I said something to the effect of, I've, I've learned that if I ever have the choice, it's almost always, it's always the right thing uh, to choose grace, to be as merciful as we can be. And someone looked at me and said, are you serious right now? And I was like, yeah, I, I, do, I am serious. And they said, I, I've never felt like that was the best way to live. <laughs> Every time I've, I've ever uh, done that, it's come back and bit me in the tail end. And I understand some of us think that to live according to the gospel feels like it's unwise at times, but God has so designed the world that even when it feels like it's the wrong thing, living according to the gospel is the right thing. In other words, what I'm trying to drive at this morning is this, that gospel wisdom, the, the wisdom of God that's shaped by the gospel, and I think it's all the wisdom of the Bible, is wisdom that leads us to gospel decisions, that presents to us the opportunity to follow God by faith according to the gospel of Jesus. And in this very passage, we see David the king being confronted with gospel wisdom. Some of it out of left field, some of it he should have seen coming, but all in all, he is being confronted with gospel wisdom and he's being given the opportunity to make gospel decisions. He must either hear grant forgiveness or carry out justice. Either way, David is being confronted with wisdom that means that he must do what it takes to reconcile or to bring peace with his son. He can't just simply leave things the way they are any longer. 
And the characters that are at hand in this passage, 2 Samuel chapter 14, they're giving David the opportunity to respond to gospel wisdom. And I think the author is helping us see this and helping us see how David at this crossroads makes some decisions that aren't quite the right decisions. And we can see the way that this cycle of sin that began with this affair with Bathsheba continues to spiral out of control. David would have done well to heed this wisdom and we would do well to heed this wisdom ourselves. And so this morning, I want to show you three points from this passage, three points from 2 Samuel 14 about gospel wisdom. Three points about gospel wisdom this morning. Here's the first. Gospel wisdom comes in many forms. Gospel wisdom comes in many forms. Now, verses 1 through 17 tell us the story of a woman, a wise woman from Tekoa coming to confront the king. Now, Joab was aware, as we see in the first three verses of chapter 14, Joab, uh, David's military commander, was uh, uh, aware that the Absalom situation was weighing heavy on the mind of David. This, it's a tricky little piece of Hebrew here when it says that David's heart or David's mind was going out to Absalom. It says the king's heart went out to Absalom. There is a tricky little piece of translation because it, it certainly at the very least means that Absalom was on his mind. It has a little bit of a negative connotation to it that he was displeased with Absalom. At the very least what we recognize this means is that Absalom in the Absalom situation was heavy on the heart of David and Joab knew that this was the case and as he says later wants to make some changes to the course of events. We'll talk a little bit about what perhaps his motivation was later. But suffice it to say right now, Joab felt the need to interfere. And so he takes a page out of the playbook of the prophet Nathan and decides to confront the king with another parable. This is another situation, one of a few in the life of David, where a woman with wisdom comes and intervenes in his life. Save me, O king, the woman says, according to the script that she had been given by Joab. She tells the story. She's a widow with two sons. And these two sons fought in a field. And as they began to quarrel in the field, one murdered the other. Does that story sound familiar to any of you? Any of you guys ever heard a story like that before? That's right. It's Cain and Abel. Genesis chapter 4. Intentionally, I think, Joab and this woman have crafted a story to make the king's mind go back elsewhere in Scripture. So, she's a widow, she has two sons, and one has now been murdered by the other. And the other family members of hers, her clan, is crying out to have the murderous son brought out and executed. What this would do then is essentially leave the woman destitute. A woman with no heir, a woman with no husband, a woman with no sons was very, very, uh, in a very precarious situation in the ancient world. So she presses David essentially to, uh, to pardon her imaginary son, which he does. In fact, she keeps pressing on him, pressing on him, pressing on him, and eventually, uh, forces him to say nothing will happen to that over and over and over again he has to say he is innocent we will make sure we will take care of him you don't have anything to worry about and as David is saying that she has him right where she wants him notice verse 12 then the woman said please let your servant speak a word to my lord the king and he said speak And the woman said, Why then have you planned such a thing against the people of God? For in giving this decision, the king convicts himself, inasmuch as the king does not bring his banished one home again. We must all die. We are like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God will not take away life. And he devises means so that the banished one will not remain an outcast. Shrewdly, Joab and this woman have 
set David's mind back to the protection that God had given Cain after he murdered his brother and the grace that God showed Cain when he murdered his brother, showing the king that they don't necessarily want him to give Absalom no consequences whatsoever, but that they did want him to reconcile, to end this cycle of sin. Now, David is being confronted with gospel wisdom. He's being pressed toward reconciliation with his son. Now, that's not to say, as I mentioned just a moment ago, that's not to say that David couldn't have carried out any form of justice. That's not to say that Absalom was right in what he did. It's only that the wisdom that David is receiving is meant to lead he and his son toward forgiveness and reconciliation, which is unquestionably a gospel good. I'm not saying that David has to sweep what Absalom did under the rug. I don't mean that. For all practical purposes, that's what he's done at this moment. He's not really dealing with it, not really meeting out any sort of justice. But here we see him being confronted with gospel wisdom. And I want you to be reminded of something today. Gospel wisdom comes in many forms. Here we see a woman coming to appeal to the king for justice. Now, this is a a common occurrence, as we'll see soon. uh, As the Absalom story continues, we'll learn more about people coming to the king for judgment and for rulings. But here we have a woman who has come to David with a fictitious story, a wise woman from Tekoa on behalf of one of his generals. And it seems like it would be the last place you would expect to find many gospel wisdom. Someone making up a story and coming and doing this. And yet, here it is, and it is the case. I I believe that what she's encouraging David to do here is good advice. I think he ought to heed what she says. Gospel wisdom comes in many forms. I want to encourage you to be on the lookout for the wisdom of God. To be on the lookout and to carefully think through the things that God might use to confront you with gospel truth. Now, I believe every time you open the Bible, you'll be confronted with gospel truth. But there are some times when God uses other means and other things to bring His Word to our mind, to bring His Word to our hearts. One place that you might expect to find gospel wisdom is in the counsel of good and godly friends. I, I, I would encourage you to listen when good and godly friends encourage you in a certain way. Uh, when your pastors or the ministers here at our church encourage you in certain ways, according to the Scriptures, to listen and to be careful. But it comes in many forms, gospel wisdom does. God may use other things to confront you with gospel truth. This world belongs to Him. One thing God's used in my life to bring my heart and mind back to His Word is beauty. Experiencing beautiful things in His creation, purely beautiful things things. Maybe maybe you would experience a gorgeous sunset or a beautiful vista or a, a, a beautiful part of nature and you can't quite enjoy it because of the lingering sin in your heart. I've been there before where there's something I ought to enjoy, a good part of God's creation that I can't quite enjoy because of the lingering sin in my heart. We can look out in the world, not only experience God's grace directly, but we can see grace in the world. What about just something as simple as seeing a movie that involves forgiveness? We value forgiveness in our culture. We write stories about forgiveness in our culture because of the influence of the Bible, because of the influence of the gospel. And perhaps you see a movie about forgiveness and it reminds you of someone you need to forgive. It's gospel wisdom coming to you in a place you might least expect it about love, the way God's built love into the world and the beauty of love into the world. I've been convicted before when I encountered someone, just a stranger, who had a kind and loving heart, and I needed to be reminded to get out of a nasty mood or even a hateful mood. Perhaps that's the case you find yourself in in different situations. All of these opportunities are opportunities to respond to the gospel wisdom of God, and it often comes in many forms. In fact, just this very morning, some of you might have read the passage, 2 Samuel 14, before you got here and said, what in the world are we going to talk about today? Who would have thought that this simple story from a wise woman would actually be a source of gospel wisdom? It comes in many forms. Be sure to remember that gospel wisdom can come 
from unexpected sources. Be reminded of these things and allow it to push you to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second of all, gospel wisdom breaks the cycle of sin. Gospel wisdom breaks the cycle of sin, or is at least designed to break the cycle of sin. Now, by verse 18, David has pretty much got his mind around what's going on. Um, He's starting to realize this story sounds a little familiar. This feels a little weird. It feels a little strange. And she seems to know a whole lot uh, uh, about me and about the inner workings of my court to be telling a story like this. So by verse 18, David starts to become suspicious. And then he flat asks the question in verse 19. Um, Some days it's just good to be king. This lady has taken a big risk and even coming. And so he's able to just say, is the hand of Joab with you in all of this? He confronts her. Of course, he's right. And by verse 21, he stops talking to this wise woman from Tekoa and begins talking directly to Joab, who crafted the plan. He tells Joab to bring back the banished one, to bring back his son Absalom. However, what we need to recognize is, first of all, that David has heeded the wisdom of Joab and the wisdom of this woman. He's listening, he's doing what they've asked him to do. And yet, what I want you to see is that he does not grant a full reconciliation. He half-heartedly hangs on to justice, and he half-heartedly hangs on to mercy. Notice what the Bible says in verse 24. And the king said about Absalom, Let him dwell apart in his own house. He is not to come into my presence. So Absalom lived apart in his own house and did not come into the king's presence. The woman earlier um, had made a point about her own clan to David that she did not want this spilling of blood to continue. I think that's a phrase that Joab intentionally gave her. And I think that's part of what Joab is trying to do. In fact, as the story progresses, we don't get any sense that Joab has any personal preference for Absalom. He doesn't join in Absalom's rebellion later in the book. So it makes you wonder why he is pushing the king in this way. But what I think Joab can see, and there are hints throughout the text, when the woman says that about the cycle or the continuation of the spilling of blood, when the Bible says that Joab didn't want things to continue in their course, when he sees the way this is hanging heavy over the heart and mind of David, I believe Joab can see where things will go if the cycle of sin is not broken. In fact, Joab's had some of this happen in his own family, the cycle of retribution, and he's participated in it himself at this point. He knows what will happen if the king continues on this route, and if Absalom continues in this way, he knows that sin will continue to multiply and grow, and that things will get worse way sooner, way before they ever get better. David then here, I believe, is being confronted with gospel wisdom. If you, David, will reconcile with your son, then the cycle of sin can be broken. But if you refuse to, things will spiral out of control. And you don't have to read ahead very far to see what happens. Friends, I think we all recognize what the gospel does. The gospel breaks the cycle of sin. But we have to live according to the gospel. We cannot half-heartedly receive gospel wisdom. It's what David's done. We've all done this to someone before. We've all done this to someone before. We've all forgiven someone, or said we'd forgiven forgiven someone. We weren't quite ready to change the way we're acting. You guys ever done this before? I'm sorry. And then you sulk the rest of the day? That's not forgiveness, just so that's clear. Right? Right? I'm sorry, but I'm going to remind you of it every time you look at me, right? And it looks like I've just bitten into a lemon every time you look at me. I'm going to remind you of how upset I am. And then what what do they do? They say, hey, Matt, are you still upset or something? No, I'm not upset. What would ever make you think that? Where, Where would you get that idea? I'm not upset. What more do you want from me? I've already said I'm sorry. Do you want me to say something else? We've all done this, right? Or at least experienced this at some level. Where sure we say 
We've forgiven someone. Sure, we say reconciliation is happening, but we aren't doing the things that actually allow us to bear gospel fruit in our hearts, in our lives, in our relationships. Here's the reality, my friends. Nothing but the gospel can break the cycle of sin. Your family may have been in decades of conflict. You may be harboring intense bitterness. Nothing but the gospel of Jesus Christ can set us free. Nothing but gospel wisdom can interfere in the cycle of sin. Nothing will let you off that hamster wheel of sin and retribution and unforgiveness but the blood of Jesus. Would you trust Him? Would you hear Him? Would you heed this wisdom today? Gospel wisdom comes from unexpected places. Gospel wisdom breaks the cycle of sin. And finally, gospel wisdom is not to be ignored. Gospel wisdom is not to be ignored. If there was a royal princes of Israel calendar, Absalom would have been on the front. We see here um, in verses 25 through 27 a sort of strange interjection that tells us as much. Now in all Israel, there was no one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. He's as good looking of a guy as you can imagine. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he cut the hair of his head, for at the end of every year he used to cut it, when it was heavy on him, for for he, he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head, 200 shekels by the king's weight. I think that's about five pounds of hair. Now, I've never weighed my hair. Um, Every time I weigh in the morning, I tell myself, I bet there's 10, 15 pounds of hair up there at least. It's been a while since you had a a haircut. (laughs) I don't know how much my hair weighs. I don't know how much your hair weighs. But The Bible's telling us here, five pounds seems like a lot of hair to me. It's certainly letting us know this this guy had beautiful hair. He was handsome in appearance. In other words, if you think about the history of the kingship of Israel, you go back to the first one. One of the factors for Saul was that he was taller than everyone else, that he was handsome in appearance. One of the factors for David over time has been the way he looked. The Bible says he was ruddy and he was attractive as a young man. And here we see then... Uh, a, a young man named Absalom, who has carried on a lot of it, who has brought into his own life, who has been given in his own life a lot of his father's gifts. We can see it in his shrewdness and his ability to be cunning. And on top of that, everyone looks at him and thinks, man, can you imagine a king like that? I mean, he looks like a lion. Look at that mane of hair he carries around with him everywhere he goes. Think about this. We already know how shrewd and cunning Absalom is, but now we see how attractive he is. And as David and then Joab joins him, continue to give Absalom the icy treatment, finally Absalom to try to get through, to try to get through the icy exterior of his father and of his father's general, he sets Joab's fields on fire to try to finally get their attention. And the episode ends finally with Absalom bowing before David and the king kissing Absalom as a signal of his restoration. But the rest of the story seems to indicate, and I think we can see it here as well, that David did this under duress. He he, he didn't genuinely forgive Absalom. That This show of restoration was just that, a show. And I think we see here that the break between David and Absalom at this point is permanently broken. Now, we can see where all this is going, can't we? A handsome, a capable young man, a potential king. And if you don't know the rest of the story, this Absalom will eventually try to take his father's throne. But David's persistent iciness, his refusal to receive this wisdom is to his own detriment. And this passage is a reminder that gospel wisdom is not something we should ignore. Right now, perhaps, you're being given the opportunity to repent. You can think of something. As I've preached this morning, you've been thinking about something you need to repent of. What is stopping you? Do it. Do not ignore the gospel wisdom of God. 
Maybe it's time to forgive that person, to offer forgiveness. Don't, don't stop. Don't run from the calling of God. Do it. Respond to God's gospel wisdom. Is it time? Is it time to settle a grudge? Is it time to extend grace? Is it time to show kindness? Is it time to respond in obedience in some other way? Today is the day, my friends. Don't ignore the gospel wisdom that God is showing you in His Word. Respond to the Lord today. Friends, this morning, gospel wisdom is coming to you from an unexpected place, from a strange, obscure passage in 2 Samuel. This morning, I want you to know gospel wisdom can break the cycle of sin in your life or your family. Respond to Jesus, and I believe He will act mightily to restore those things which have been broken. Trust God that His way is best. Respond in faith to His gospel. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Do not, my friends, ignore gospel wisdom. Because right now, it feels like a burden. It feels like a burden to follow the Lord. Anyone who's in sin... Feels like repentance is a burden. But nothing will lighten your load. Nothing will free you from despondency. Nothing will give freedom in your heart and life like the gospel of Jesus Christ. God means it for your good for you to follow him today. Do not ignore his gospel wisdom. Hear his word and follow him. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. Today, my friends, I hope you would respond to the Lord in faith. Here's what I hope to do. I hope to offer an invitation to each of you this morning. And here in a moment, we'll pray. And I want you to respond to the Lord um, as we have a hymn of invitation in just a few moments. First, you may be an unbeliever. You may, may, have, may have never trusted Jesus for the first time. What a joy it would be for me today to talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus. I, I believe if you'll turn from your sins in repentance and turn to God in faith, through faith in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You don't have to come talk to me to do that. You can do that right where you are. But if you need someone to talk to, after this prayer, I'll be waiting for you down front. Second of all, you may be a believer and you may say, Pastor, I need to respond to what I've heard from your word, from God's Word today. Um, you, may, you may say to the Lord, I need to respond to your Word even now. You can do it right where you are. You can do it here at this altar. If you need someone to talk to, I'll be waiting down front for you as the song plays. And finally, you may be looking for a church home. If God's leading you to be a member here at First Baptist Gadsden, I'd love for you to come forward today. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a member here. After this prayer, as the song plays, I want to invite you to come. Let's pray together.